For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the, in the one spirit we were, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member but of many. If the foot would say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would, ma that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for, of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker and indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater, greater respect, whereas our, our most respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension between the body. But the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ, individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power. Then gifting of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues are all... Yeah, that's it. I have to tell you this. First off, to know when to quit. That was great. That's it. He's like, that's it. I, uh, Andy, uh, my, our son, was supposed to read that, and he had his wisdom teeth taken out uh, about four days ago, and yesterday we just knew it was not going to be possible, and so last minute I got in touch with Luke, and I said, Luke, can you do this? And he was willing to step up. Great job, my friend. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. The, uh, the first thing I want to do is, is explain this. So I went to Lamar, because a lot of people have probably gone to Lamar and said, what were you thinking? But I went to Lamar because I knew that I was going to be here for a few Sundays, and I said, listen, if, if there just comes a Sunday where you need someone, um, I really take just a lot of joy in teaching. And it's something that I never get to do anymore. When I was at Lakeview and I wasn't singing, I wasn't traveling, I was teaching Sunday school classes. I was teaching uh, the evangelistic classes on Monday. I was teaching the men's classes on Sunday afternoon. I love teaching. And so when I started traveling, we would do about 200 days a year, and we would only be home about four Sundays out of the entire year. And so really the chance to teach just kind of went away. And it's not something I've been able to do for about 12 or 13 years years so to stand here and teach it really is an honor and a privilege so uh, Lamar thank you for allowing me to do this and thank you for showing up I'm shocked anyone came so let's jump right into the text that Luke read earlier and at first glance it seems pretty simple Paul is using the analogy of the body to talk about the church and what he's saying is in the Corinthian church people were saying well I'm an eye, but I'd rather be an ear, or I'm a foot, and I'd rather be a, a hand. And there were a lot of problems going on in the Corinthian church because this group was against this group, and this guy wanted to be this position, and this lady wanted to be this position. But all believers have different roles in the local body. And if we take that for granted, like they did in the Corinthian church, we'll have the troubles that they did as well. But right off the bat, this is going to be a weird question to start off a Sunday morning church service, but there's one thing that we have to settle before we go any further into this discussion. So we're in 1 Corinthians. Who wrote 1 Corinthians? What do you think? It's okay. I like Q&A. Who wrote it? Paul. What could be another answer? Jesus, I hear. What's another answer? 
Holy Spirit? What's another answer? <laughs> There's a lot of answers out there. Confusion, right? Who wrote this? And it is hard to grasp that Paul, with all of his personality, Paul, with all of his history, Paul, with all of his knowledge, Paul, with all of his background, could pin something that something else gives him. Is it possible that the Holy Spirit, God, breathed every word of this book into these men and they simply just wrote what they heard so that we cannot look at this scripture and say, well, that was just Paul being Paul or, well, you know, Matthew said that because of this, that, or the other. I want us to look at just a few verses because if we can settle this debate here, then the next 25 minutes or so are going to be very fulfilling because we can read the scripture with confidence that it's God saying this and not just someone from a couple of thousand years ago. This is a living and a breathing word. Now, I'm going to be going through a lot of texts. I only gave Chris that first one, so I encourage you, if you've got something to jot down, do that. If you've got your Bible, your phone, your iPad, your Kindle, whatever you've got at home watching on Facebook, I encourage you to do the same thing. Or you can go home uh, and, and say, you know what, I'm going to go take a look at these verses. I don't know if I trust him. <laughs> That's okay as well. Let's look at 1 Corinthians. If you want to go there, you're more than welcome to. You can just jot it down. I'll, I'll read it to where we can understand it. Verse 12, we're in chapter 2. Look at verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, listen, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts, spiritual words. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20. This is fantastic. But know this first of all, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Wow. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Last one, 2 Timothy 3.16. And you'll be familiar with this one. All Scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. And I went the extra mile on this one, and I went and I looked at the Greek, the Hebrew, the Arabic. I looked at all of those and Amazingly enough, the word all literally means all. All Scripture is inspired by God. Let's look at the first division that was in the Corinthian church. Luke talked about something that's on into chapter 12, but Paul discusses something that's in chapter 1, and this is really fascinating. So if you're in 1 Corinthians, you can just skip over to chapter 1, and looking at verse 10... Chapter 1, verse 10, this is a major problem in the Corinthian church, and it's a major problem in the American church as well. Now, I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Verse 11, for I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. And here's what I mean. Each of you is saying, I am of Paul. I am of uh, Apollos. I am of Cephas. I am of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So the first thing we see here is like a, um, what you could call a click style of worship. And it happens in all churches. It's, it's been in every church that I've ever been in. One group says, well, I'm with them over there. That's more kind of my speed. And then this group will say, well, I'm not really for that. I'm just going to scoot over here. And what happens is between the members of the body, where there is to be no division, we see bitterness and we see anger and we see jealousy and we start to feel defeated 
and then some members of the body just pack up and leave. And then some stay where they are and just decide, you know what, I'm throwing my hands up, I give, I'm just gonna let somebody else handle this. And when that happens, too many vital parts of the body are missing for the church to be effective. So now there was another issue in Corinth and that's where we're at in chapter 12. First thing I wanna do though, this is really cool. They were talking about, uh, when Luke read that, he was talking about different gifts that had been given out. If you go back to Acts chapter two and we look at Pentecost, here's what happens. So the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, right? You know this story. And a, a sound like a mighty rushing wind comes into the room. And literally what the Bible says is tongues of fire descend on the people and they begin to speak in another language. Now, I have dear friends in the Pentecostal movement. This is not a slam on them. What you see on television today is not what happened then. They were literally speaking languages. And here's proof. This is what it says in Acts 2, verse 5. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together. They were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, aren't these all Galileans? But we hear them in our own language. And then they give a list of nation after nation after nation that's hearing the mighty deeds of God in their own language. And verse 12 says, they continued in amazement, great perplexity. What does this mean? But then others were mocking and saying, they're just full of sweet wine. They thought they were drunk, right? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know what group I would fall into. I'm just being honest. Let's, uh, even though that doesn't happen today, it's, it's not a gift to where you're speaking other languages like it did in the first century church. Let's just imagine, we're just going to imagine that Nikki is up here and she's doing her thing and she is welcoming and she is just right on the money. And we have a young lady who's a foreign exchange student and her English is broken and she's not really catching on to what's saying. And all of a sudden, Eva Barker stands up and you hear the purest Mandarin you have ever heard in your entire life. I'm gonna be honest with you. She's never taken a drink a day in her life but I would probably say, yeah, she hit the bottle. <laughs> She's lost it. The woman has lost it. And then let's say uh, Lamar, he was up here, let's say Lamar stands up and tells all of us what she is saying, interprets it so that we can hear the mighty deeds of God in our language. What a gift. That is an amazing gift. So you can see where some who are called by God to wipe down the chairs, to sweep the floors, to clean the dishes, might become jealous because God's letting these people stand up front and speak other languages. God's letting these people heal sick. God's letting these people stand up front and teach and prophesy and speak the words of God. And when these people get done, oh, pat on the back, right? But when you get done washing dishes or you get done wiping down chairs, there's no one there congratulating you. There's no one there clapping. And so this is what was happening. Why do I have to be a foot? Why can't I be a hand? So on and so forth. The first truth that you have to come to grips with is found in verse 18. If you've got your Bibles, I encourage you, Luke read it, verse 18, this is phenomenal. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. And many of us think that we have the position we have because we were voted in. Some people wrote our names down and we got more, 
our name was written more than someone else's, and so we got that position. Or we may think, you know what, somebody had quit and nobody was taking it, so I just took it, right? God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. Wow, I love that. So it's God who placed us in Christ, and it's God who placed us in the body where we serve now. And so some will ask, I don't really get this. We need to build a foundation, and we can do this in about three or four minutes. What does it mean for God to place you? Romans 8, 28. By the way, you're not going to hear one opinion from me. I don't have an opinion. If you say, what's my opinion on something, I'm going to say, well, what does the Bible say about that? Or what do you think about that? And that's not because I'm so spiritual. It's because my opinion is useless. If I just come to you with my thoughts or, or what I just came up with in my head, why would I give you that when I can give you this? So here's what it says in Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes, not allows, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called. There it is. What does it mean to be called? Called according to his purpose. A lot of people will quit halfway through that verse, don't they? Haven't you heard that? All things work together for good, right? You've heard that. All things work together for good. But that's not the whole kit and caboodle. All things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Ephesians 1.4 says this, Ephesians 1.4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us to adoption. Luke was baptized last week. I don't know how many of y'all we're here for that. It was a wonderful service. It really was. Nikki was fantastic. Everything was great. It was just a, a sweet spirit there around the pool there at Lamar and Diane's. But that was a symbol, an outside symbol of something that happened on the inside, right? And it happened for Luke several months ago. But in reality, according to Scripture, it happened before the foundation of the world. Think about it. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So what does that mean? How can we kind of wrap that around our brains? Before God said, let there be light, he wrote, let there be Luke, and let there be you and you. Before the foundation of the world. Second Thessalonians 2.13 But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because he has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see in these verses, and there's countless verses in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I narrowed it down to three where the Holy Spirit placed you in Christ, and it was God who placed you in the body. And you may be fine with that. You may be okay with where you are, actually. You may like the position you're in. Many times we are satisfied with where we are, but are we satisfied with where someone else is? See, if it's God who placed you, it's God who placed them. And so if we're going to be good with where we are, we've got to be good where God has someone else. Chapter 7, verse 17, helps to settle this debate. By the way, every question you have is answered in this blessed book. Here's what it says, 1 Corinthians 7, 17. Only let each person lead the life that a Lord has assigned to him. Let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. There it is again. God called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Just a side note. You want to know why we built a foundation early on that God wrote this book? 
more times than I could possibly imagine. Just because of what I do for a living, I have literally been in thousands of churches um, all over the world. And I have heard this more times than I could ever imagine. Someone will say, when you read, this is my rule in all the churches, and if, if they want to skirt a certain issue, they'll go, well, see, that was, that was Paul's rule. That's not, no. The Bible said that God wrote every word. So if it's Paul's rule, or Peter's rule, it's Matthew's rule, if it's Moses, it's God. Many times we feel like someone is not putting in the effort that we are. Have you ever been there? I keep using the chairs because it's so interesting that people have to clean off the chairs after every service. But let's say... Um, let's say Allison cleans off 50 chairs. And let's say um, Rita cleans off 20. And let's say uh, Wendell cleans off five. Wendell, you're so lazy. It would be very simple for Allison to say, I don't understand why they don't put in the effort that I put in. If they would just put in the effort, this would go so much smoother. This would go so much quicker. She would not have that attitude. That's why I used her. <laughs> but it would be easy to do in a church setting. I love this quote. I don't know this young lady. I, I did a lot of studying over the past two weeks. This was a quote that uh, Holly Sprink, this is from her book, Faith Postures. I don't know Holly, but this is a great quote. Instead of thinking those who don't share your passions are not real Christians, Recognize the beauty of diversity within the body of Christ. Instead of being angry with others for not feeling your urgency about an issue, just give them time to come around. Isn't that great? I love that. And I reached out to Barry Howard uh, about a week and a half ago, and he sent me a text back. He said, that's funny. I'm preaching the exact same um, scripture next week. So next week at his church, he's preaching this exact same scripture. So what he did was he sent me his first draft of his sermon. And he said, anything you can use, use it. And it is no shock to anyone, his first draft was way more organized than my final draft. And he used the team concept. That's probably Amanda made him do that. Here's what he says. You're an important part of the team but be careful not to critique or micromanage other team members. You are not responsible for anyone's position but your own. Right? Isn't that what it said? Only let each person lead the life the Lord has assigned to him. Effective teamwork requires that every team member accepts responsibility for executing his or her assignment. Wow. And truth be told, you may not be worried where God has someone else. You may be concerned with where God has you. Now listen, if we say we are useless, we not only say no to the idea of the body, but worse, we say no to God. We don't trust him. Not all of us are teachers and administrators. Public leaders are important to the body, but they are not more important than the person who watches the babies in the nursery, the person who cleans the dishes after the homecoming the person who sweeps the floors when all the chairs have been put away or performing any task that might seem lackluster. Our gifts and talents are all necessary for a well-functioning church. So here's a question, and you're more than welcome to raise your hand if you've got an answer. I, I would love that. Can you think, that's God who put our actual bodies together, and it's God who placed us in the body. Can you think of any better place on your body for your eyes than where they are? Anyone? No. What about your ears? Your mouth? Your hands? God put the parts of the body where they needed to be for the body to function at its fullest, and he's done the same thing here. And you are best where you are if you are where God is evidently wants you to be. I appreciate Linnell. <clears throat> you won't believe this, but she talks back sometimes. 
And I've shared with her some of my thoughts on this. And when I shared that, she said, now, wait a minute, what does that mean? How can you know that you are evidently where God wants you to be? And so I shared this story. I did not get permission, but I'm going to share it anyway. You can just beat me up later, Sean. Daddy was here for 30 years. 30 years. Roy Barker was the choir director here. <clears throat> and he was made <clears throat> for that. Right? He was built for that. To lead that choir and to lead that congregation. He could get something out of folks like nobody else could get it. And he did it for 30 years. Now... Later on, when he started to reach retirement age and after retirement, he started exercising other gifts because he was in a different place in his life. You'd see him delivering food. You'd see him at the hospitals. He started really doing a lot of those more serving gifts. But still, you just knew Roy Barker was made to be hands, to be feet, to be those out front gifts. He was just so good at it. So if he was at a church for 30 years, wouldn't you imagine, wouldn't you imagine that the day after he passed away, he passed away on a Saturday, that next day, we might as well just call church off, right? I mean, we might as well. I mean, he was here for 30 years. But if you go back and look on our YouTube page, our Facebook page, Chris does such an incredible job putting that together. If you go back, you'll see the choir come out. There's about 25 or 30 of them. They're emotional. You'll see Chris, you'll see Nikki, and then you see Sean come out. After 30 years, the next day the choir was able to stand up and sing, this is the day this is the day. You ought to go back and look at it. It blesses me every time I see it. How? How was the church able to move on after losing 30 years of hands and feet? Because one of those folks with the gift of helping, one of those inner parts, stepped up and took over. And I'm telling you, listen to me, the church can continue if it has a hand cut off and it has a foot cut off, just like the body can continue. I can continue blind, I can continue deaf, but I cannot exist without the inner parts doing what they do, and neither can the church. But it didn't take long for Sean who was built to be a helper to evidently know that his gifts were vitally used somewhere else. And so they start looking for someone else who can be up front. And that's when we found Linnell and her Uber driver. Because <laughs> that's all I am, <laughs> trust me. But if the inner parts say, you know what, I'm just going to stand back and I'm just going to let this happen, the church will crumble because God's created it that way. God's made it that way. Listen to this, verse 22. You heard Luke read it, listen. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem weaker are necessary. Those members that seem less honorable on these we bestow more honor. And whereas our more presentable members have no need of it, but God has so composed the body, giving more honor to the members that lacked. Verse 26. Oh, please get this. Please get this. Verse 26. If one member suffers, we all suffer. And if one member rejoices, we all rejoice. That's how God's composed the body. We sang the chorus of family of God. Do y'all know those verses? We never sing the verses. And I'm wrapping up. 
We never sing the verses, but here's one of the verses. You will notice we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family and the folks are so near. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear. Wow, I love that. So the final question is, we've asked, are you in the body? Are you all in? Are you all in? Are you where you are confident God wants you? Are you giving it everything you have? Are you too busy with your own task to bother worrying about someone else's? Are you all in? Final verse. If you can turn there, I encourage you to do so. If you can't, write it down. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verse 1. What a thought. This is great. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The path has been set before us, but it is up to us to run the race set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Last verse. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Two words in that final verse. Consider him. Who's him? Christ. Consider Christ. When you lose heart, consider Christ. When you feel like your gift isn't as necessary as someone else's. Consider Christ. When you feel like throwing in the towel and moving on, consider Christ. Those of you watching on Facebook, YouTube, maybe you had a place where God was using you and you became bitter and you became angry can I encourage you, consider Christ. You are a vital, vital part of the body of Christ, as is each one of you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that it is you who composed the body. We are thankful that it is you who placed us in Christ. We are thankful that we have this opportunity to ask ourselves, are we really all in? Are we giving it everything we have? Have we surrendered everything that holds us back? Every sin that entangles us so that we can be used to the fullest in the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.